Hey everybody, this is Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with my class on great players of the past. The great player of the past is Duncan Suttles. Unfortunately, I never had the chance to meet him even though he was an American and Canadian citizen. He was born in California and he spent uh, probably 90% of his life in, in Canada. Um, and he was good friends with Yasser Sarawan in the 70s. And I want to thank um, Aunt Anna or Aunt Anna for uh, teaching chess and making Wolfgang Fleckenstein's life better. He's our sponsor. And uh, somebody has to teach you chess, and that's the person who can change your life. So in this case, it's Aunt Anna. And, don't, and she's not a salad dressing, she's a person. So don't, don't give me any of that. Okay, and uh, we'll thank Wolfgang, obviously, for sponsoring the stream. He's, if you're watching live, which you're not, you're watching on YouTube. But if you were watching live, which a few people are, um, he, he's watching from Germany and it's midnight. So that means he's not yet intoxicated. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not, it's Monday, so who, who knows? Okay, so Duncan Suttles, I always considered as a Canadian player because he played for Canada in the Olympiads, even though he was born in the U.S. Um, he sort of went back and forth, but mainly he, he, lived in, he lived in Canada. And he was born in San Francisco. And he's one of the few players ever, I think maybe Kerez is another one, maybe, uh, that was a grandmaster in real life and a grandmaster at correspondence chess. And most grandmasters don't play correspondence chess. And if I may add, maybe I can't, if a grandmaster did play correspondence chess, they wouldn't necessarily be good at it because they might think I'm a grandmaster and they don't use technology or use the books or use hours and hours and hours of study. They just like, I'm a grandmaster, this move's good, let's send that move. Now, when Duncan Suttles played correspondence chess, it's not like correspondence chess now where you play over the internet. Um, a friend of mine was one of the top 10 correspondence players in the world, and he was 1950 at slow chess, and his name was Gary Abram. But he was a statistician, and he kept really good records, and he would take hours per move and days. So somehow uh, Duncan Suttles was really good at over-the-board chess and really good at correspondence chess. And as Wikipedia points out, uh, between Abe Yanofsky and Kevin Spraggett, he was the best player in Canada. And he actually played some with Kevin Spraggett. He probably played Yanofsky too. Yanofsky played until he was pretty old. Um, unfortunately, Duncan Suttles hasn't played chess in 35, 40 years, and that's why I've never met him. Um, he quit chess in the late 70s, early 80s, I think early 80s, and he uh, founded a computer company software firm called Magnetar Games, and he's the president and chief technology officer. So I guess that makes more money than being like a you know, strong grandmaster. I think top 10 in the world, you could make more money, but not, he wasn't top 10 in the world, but he was pretty good. Um, and he's, he's one of the many grandmasters who isn't known to a lot of people because a lot of people, especially today, only know current players, and they don't know players from 30, 40, 50 years ago. Luckily, I was taught chess by my dad, so I know all the players from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, because my dad talked about them all the time uh, when we were growing up, because those were his, his heroes. And he, he talked about Suttles, and Suttles played a very unusual style very difficult to be a grandmaster playing the way he did because he played very imaginatively and he didn't play what other grandmasters played. He played what he wanted to play. And unlike a lot of grandmasters who do that, and I could name some, Pavel Blotny, for example, uh, he didn't beat weak players and lose to strong grandmasters like, like I would do, for example. If I played top 10, top 20, top 30 in the world, I would lose. And if I played 22, 23 hundreds, I would win. And then I became a grandmaster because most of my opponents were lower rated than me. 
and I used to be better than I am now. Duncan Suttles beat all kinds of strong grandmasters playing his unusual style of chess, and I wanted to show uh, some games that I liked. Unfortunately, the sponsor mentioned Fisher and Karpov, but I found other games, so now he's going to ban me from my own stream, I think, something like that. Okay, and you can read a lot about Duncan Suttles on Wikipedia, and you can always tell how good somebody is, not just in chess, but in general, by how long their Wikipedia article is. So my Wikipedia article is Ben Feingold, and then you don't have to scroll. It's just like one thing. It says like Ben was born, and somehow he's still alive, and he, you can't lose the GM title because you keep it for life. That's like my Wikipedia article. His Wikipedia article is like the early years representing Canada, Olympic stalwart, and he played in many Olympiads uh, for Canada, mainly on board one and two, and he did pretty well considering Canada has never been a powerhouse in the Olympiads, if you know what I mean. Then they talk about him becoming a citizen, getting married, becoming a grandmaster, and they talk a lot about his playing style. They don't talk about that in, in, in my Wikipedia. They say he has no style. And I, th I thought it looked pretty nice. And uh, he played a lot of different openings, and most of the openings he was fianchettoing his bishops and playing modern and hyper-modern style and the modern defense. And then notable chess games, I don't have that in my Wikipedia. That's a lot of notable chess games. I mean, for a guy that most people frankly haven't heard of, because most people who are watching this stream are in their teens, 20s, and 30s, and Suttles quit chess before you were born, and Suttles wasn't top 10 in the world, so you guys are like, who's that? And he was very good friends with Yasser Sarawan, and I'm good friends with Yasser Sarawan, and Sarawan talks about Suttles a lot. Um, and if, if I may, Yasser told me a story that in San Antonio 72, which by the way, was my favorite book growing up as a kid. That book had pictures of the players, and it had little mini biographies. It had the games all annotated, and some of the players were Petrosian, Karpov, uh, Walter Brown, uh, I'm missing somebody, oh, Paul Carez, and of course, Duncan Suttles, and I think there were 12 players. And uh, <clears throat> at some point in the tournament, Yasser said Fisher showed up, and he's like, I'm Fisher, you know, look at me. And he would analyze some of the games with the people there, including one of Suttles games. They were, would sit down and people were analyzing the games and he would, he would help. But he, did, he didn't play chess, but you know, it's in the US and he's in the US and it's a lot of the best players in the world. So he thought he'd show up and hang out, hang out with his good buddy, Duncan Suttles. Okay, and you can see on Wikipedia, uh, if you wanna do some research on your own, like what kind of openings he played, who his friends were, and his notable chess games you can click. And I mean, it's a really big Wikipedia article for somebody who wasn't like top five, top 10 in the world. And I would say for a lot of people who are top five, top 10 in the world, their, their article is, is less so. Because Duncan Suttles was a very interesting player and his games are very interesting. He had lots of decisive games and didn't have this plethora of draws that we see now at the top level because he didn't play for a draw, he didn't want to draw, and you could see from his games, they weren't tending towards a draw. They were tending towards somebody winning, and that puts a lot of people off when they don't feel like they're in control of the game. But when the game was weird and unusual and played in a hyper-modern style, he felt very comfortable, and his opponents weren't used to that, and they didn't like that. You know, when they're white, they want to be slightly better in pressing. With black, you want to be slightly worse in equalizing. And that didn't happen in his games. His games were hard to understand. So his opponents were thrown off. Okay, let's go to the games. This is the game I wanted to do first. And I wanted to show, like, if you looked at my best games, probably my opponents would be between 2,000 and 2,500. Those are the games where I really overpowered them and I played well and so forth. Duncan Suttles' best games were just for me, like which super grandmaster game should I show where he won? And so 
You know, when I was growing up, I thought, I, I grew up in the 70s. I was born in 1969. When I grew up, I thought Suttles was like one of the best players in the world because I heard about him a lot. You know, I, I heard of Fisher and Karpov and Korshnoi, and Suttles is one of the guys I'd heard of, and he played in San Antonio 72, so he must be one of the top players in the world. And he wasn't top five or top ten, but he was really good. And he beat a lot of super GMs. And this is a game against Bent Larson, played in the 70s, and Bent Larson in the 70s was, you know, top five, top six in the world. Although, if you ask Bent Larson, he would put himself higher. Okay, and Duncan has white, and they got to this end game where he takes on G6. Queen, and we get this very unusual ending, rook and four pawns versus rook and bishop. And by the way, Bent Larson played very unusual openings like Duncan Suttles, but Larson did something else that Suttles didn't. Sometimes Larson didn't play an unusual opening. Sometimes Larson just played the main lines. Um, so after a crazy game, they get down to this position where white's trying to win and black's trying to draw, but there's too many passed pawns, I think. Um, although beating somebody who's top five in the world isn't easy, they defend pretty well. Okay, so Suttles pinned the bishop. He wanted a bishop against four pawns without the rooks, then he wouldn't get checked at all. So Larson played a very sneaky move, rook a1. And obviously you can't take the bishop because rook a3 check skewers. And by the way, if I was a betting man, I would bet that's a draw, blundering my rook. Because I got four connected, I got four pass pawns. Eh, maybe it's a win, I don't know. It's close. But anyway, nobody's going to fall for that. So he played d5. He wants to put his king on the dark squares every move because Larson has a white squared bishop. So he vacates the d4 square for his king so it won't get checked. Okay, bishop f5 blockading, stopping the king from going up one square. He gets the bishop out of there. And then he plays c5. Larson goes behind the pass pawn, rook check. And now black has to make a big decision and there's not really a good answer. If he moves over to the king side, which he did, then white's queen side pawns are hard to stop. If he moves over to the queen side, the king side pawns are hard to stop. Now, personally, I would move to the queen side. I would, because my bishop is trying to hold this. So I need my king to hold this. But it's going to be losing in any case. He played king f7, rook e5, which was going to be played in any case. Check. Got to go back, forcing him back. Attacks the f pawn. And Larson's hoping for king e3, rook d3, draw. Now, most of the people watching are club players. They're not grandmasters. Very few grandmasters watch my videos. And a lot of my students in the past, because I don't teach anymore, are they would play king e3 and repeat, and the game went under the draw. And when I'd say, why did you do that? They would say, every time, I didn't see how to win. Well, you don't see how to win on move one, but you don't agree to a draw. I mean, you play chess and then hopefully you win. You have to evaluate the position. White has no losing chances. Even if it's rook and bishop versus rook, theoretically it's a draw, although it's hard to draw. But with four pawns, white should win. And if white can't win because it's some weird position, white should try to win. Because, you know, try to win, you four pawns. Okay, so he played c6, <clears throat> ignoring his f pawn, because he's got pawns on the queen side he can promote. Rook takes f4, then c7. Now, if Larson plays bishop f5, we just take it, and then we queen. So he's not going to fall for that. He'll play rook c4, and Suttles played d6. Now, if it was Suttles' move, if... He would play d7. Okay, and then Larson would turn the board around and try to play white, but it wouldn't work. He'd try though. Okay, so 
I think there's only one move in the position. Bishop a4, stopping d7, rook e7 check. And when Suttles sacrificed his f-pawn, he saw that this would happen. This is forced. The rook has to go behind the c-pawn. Bishop has to stop the d-pawn. He checks away. The king went to g6. If I had the black pieces, actually, I would play king g6. Now, irrespective of what black does, let's say black plays king f8. White still plays d7. This is actually quite funny, is that all three white pieces on the seventh rank are attacked. Right? They're all attacked by black, but, I mean, I'm threatening to promote two pawns, and if you take my rook, I promote my d-pawn. So, so what he did was, Larson thought he would sack his bishop for one pawn, his king would take the other pawn, then he maybe he has drawing chances. So he tried that. But you know what I like to say? Trying is the first step to failure. And maybe this is a draw. My king runs over. Unfortunately, Suttles gains a valuable tempo. Duncan wants his king on d6, so he can play rook d8 and c7. So he plays king d3. And unfortunately, black can't stay on the fourth rank to stop white's king, because black has to stop this pawn from queening. So he just keeps moving up. And the black king can't get back in time. Now, if you ask me, you didn't ask me, I think Suttles saw this position when he played c6. Because he's a strong grandmaster and it's pretty forced. He saw takes, rook c4 is forced, bishop a4 is forced. Now he's going to play d7, so black might as well win the g-pawn, otherwise he'll be down two pawns. And then king d3, king, d, king, king here. I think he saw that when he played c6. Otherwise, you're taking a chance, giving your pawns away, and then it's a draw. I think he saw when he gave his pawns away, it would be a win. And in this position, uh, Larson resigned because there's nothing you can do about king here, rook up queen. If you check the king, the king can easily hide, and that's a book win. So, well, he didn't do that. So there's Suttles winning um, a subtle endgame against one of the best players in the world, and he did that often. He had a lot of, a lot of good games. Now let's concentrate on full games after that. Okay, this is the only flip the board. First of all, I have to figure out how. Okay, now I warned you, and Wolfgang knows, the rest of you may not know, that Suttles played a certain way in the opening, and he almost always did it. And there's a grandmaster from Egypt... Man, I finally remembered his name. Jesus. His name is Sammy Shoker. Well, you're nodding like you know who I'm talking about. Okay. Sammy Shoker, who, I, who I've met and played, and he's like the nicest guy ever. And he's the only guy that I know of that gave a lecture at St. Louis Chess Club in a different language. He did it in French, and they put it on the website. So if you speak French and go to the St. Louis Chess Club YouTube page, go, click Sammy Shoker, and you can watch him lecture in French. And he's lived in France and Egypt. He's lived in both. I think he's lived in another country, too. In fact, I think he was in the U.S. briefly. But I met him in, in uh, the UAE. We were playing in a, in a, a team tournament, uh, and then I saw him again in St. Louis, and I played him in a St. Louis GM round robin, and we drew a very long game where I was much worse, then I was a little better, and then it was a draw. That game was about 70 moves. And the reason I mentioned him, which Wolfgang already knows, he plays in a similar style to Suttles. He's fee and kettoing all of his bishops, and he's playing an unusual way, and he's getting good positions. Okay, this is Lubomir Kavalik who I believe I've done a great players of the past on, and Larson. And Kavalik was a Czech grandmaster, and then he moved to the U.S. in the late 60s, early 70s. And he played for the U.S. Olympic team and the U.S. championship for 25 years. And he had a column in the Washington Post, maybe, 
some, some newspaper. Then he had a column in, in what? What's that liberal thing that I, I never read? I'm too liberal. Huffington Post. Yes, I'm thinking of names now. So Kavalik has had chess columns in the Washington Post and Huffington Post, as long as it has posts in it. And for cereal, he never ate Kellogg's, just post. Okay, and Kavalik was white. Kavalik, I would say, at his absolute best, was top 20 in the world. And he played in Montreal 79, and he proved it. In the second half of the tournament, he got the best score. Okay, so G6, that's how Suttles rolls. D6. Okay, let's get some other, let's get something else to the third rank. There we go, A6. And sometimes Suttles would play E6 and Knight E7, depending on the variation. But here he would just play like a regular uh, Pierce. A4 stopping B5. And then B6. So half of his pawns went to the third rank because that's what Suttles like to do. And he would fee and kettle both of his bishops. And his opponents would say, I've never studied this. Nowadays, people study everything. But, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, that wasn't necessarily the case. They didn't have a lot of chess books on this, this kind of play, just putting your pawns on the third rank. They figured you just weren't a good player if you did that. Rook e1, bishop b7, threatening the e4 pawn. So white's play doesn't make a lot of sense. He played bishop e2, then bishop c4. So he's lost a tempo. And he's defending his center. And he probably wants to play e5 now. So e6 was played. And now if you play e5, I can take, and my knight can go to d5 or to d7, and my bishop is wide open, and your e-pawn's just going to get attacked. So Suttles puts five of his pawns on the third rank. Kavalik puts his pawns on the fourth rank. So you would think white should be better because he has more space. But it's not easy to find a plan for white. Pushing the pawns more weakens a lot of squares and opens up the bishop. If you play this, this bishop's really good. If you play d5, this bishop's really good. Pawns on e4 and d4 are pretty good, but black can attack them. Okay, bishop f4, knight d7. And to be perfectly honest, with my chess understanding now the way that it is, which isn't saying much, I would rather have black here than white. Because I don't know what to do with white. If I do anything, it's going to be bad. And this reminds me of the game I played Sammy Shoker, where I had this big lead in development and center, and then it just all collapsed immediately, and I was fighting for a draw. Okay, queen d2, and he played b5. Now you might say, wait a minute, b5 is a pawn sacrifice, but actually it's not. <laughs> and that's because the hip bone's connected to the leg bone. The leg bone, here's why. This is defending this, and it's defending this. So if I play rook takes rook, then your e pawn's not defended as much. And this knight is attacking this, but it's also defending this. So you're going to move either this knight or this rook, one of them, probably the rook, off of the e pawn, I'm going to take it. And if you don't take my pawn on b5, if you move your bishop back, I'll play b4, attacking your knight, and your pawn can't be defended sufficiently. So you're going to win a side pawn for your e4 pawn. That's not good. That's good for black. Black wins a center pawn. Takes, takes. Now, if white trades rooks, black takes with the queen, and we have more pressure on e4. So Suttles figured out that b5 was a really strong move, and obviously Kavalik missed it when he was playing all his developing moves and playing solid. Takes, queen takes, bishop takes, bishop takes. You can't play knight takes because knight takes, bishop takes, bishop takes d7. White's up a piece. So you have to take with a bishop, which is fine. And now, if you take the knight on d7, I can take the knight on f3. And black will be fine. So he played knight takes e4. Knight takes e4. You can't take the knight because your queen is attacked. 
Black has a much better center than white now. Black has the two center pawns. So white decided to get two rooks, two pieces for a rook and a pawn, but his pieces aren't very good. Actually, it's just a rook. But white's pieces aren't very good, and black's queen and rook are very good, and his bishop's really good. And so this is a weird position, because you would assume white has two pieces for a rook, he has to be better, but black's already threatening rook a1 check. And white is just defending. White can't attack anything. There's nothing in black's position to attack. So he played h4 to get luft. Queen b7. This attacks the pawn on b2. This is a brilliant move. It attacks the pawn on b2. If you play a boring move to defend your pawn, like b3 or c3, then c6 traps your bishop. And I'm sure Subtle saw that when he played b5. And <clears throat> your bishop getting trapped... How do I get my bishop out? Well, bishop obviously not good on d7. It's deep in black's territory. It could easily get trapped. Okay, he played d5, which looks silly, but it saves his bishop. There's no other way to save your bishop. Your bishop can't move, and I'm going to play c6. Or c5. If you play queen c3, I could play c5. Your bishop still has no escape square, and I got a pin going on here. So Suttles was a genius to see this. So d5, now bishop c6 is a possibility. And if you take the pawn, my bishop can escape and I won't lose my bishop. It's better not to lose your bishop. So, okay, so he played e5, attacking the bishop. Bishop moved. And he took on b2. And it's weird, white's pieces just are no good. White's bishop can't attack anything. White's knight can't attack anything. And white has the weak pawns, and black is going to enter on the eighth rank. So this is a situation where the rook and pawn are better than the two pieces. It's very unusual. H5, here he comes. Doubling on the eighth rank, coming to get him. Takes, check, takes. Bishop h3 blocking the black queen out. Queen c1. If white trades queens, how does he save his c2 pawn? The answer is he doesn't. If white doesn't trade queens and makes random legal move, checkmate. Who would have thought having your bishop on d7 and your king on g3 was bad? But yeah. Okay, so he played h6 check. And then he played c4, trying to save his kingside pawns. And now, black's rook is fantastic. White's bishop on h3 is terrible. And you can't save your h6 pawn. So he goes and takes it. Now we have a rook and two pawns for two pieces. And the c4 pawn is weak. The bishop is bad on h3. So he gets his bishop to a good square. He defends his c pawn, the only pawn white can attack. Then he pushes his king side. That's what I call pushing your king side. And white's pieces are just helpless. I mean, white's bishop's been trapped in black's territory for the last 15 moves, and it can't do anything. And it can't attack. No, nothing in black's position can be attacked. And black is just pushing all of his extra pawns, and these aren't well situated to stop them. So this game really shows what a genius Suttles was. Sacrifices material, he has tricky moves which win back material, and he trades queens into an ending, like the last ending, where he has many extra pawns. Attacks the c-pawn, Suttles doesn't care. Man, the truth hurts. Now you can't play f3, because never play f3. Even in the 1970s, Kavalik knew that. If you play f3, I take this, or I play h3. <clears throat> you guys paid to watch the lecture so you can decide which move you want to play that wins. They both win. So you can't let him play rook takes f2 because then you're going to have four pawns. Whoa, I flipped the board by accident. You're going to have four pawns that are coming down the board against one pawn. That's not going to work out well. So he played king g1 defending his pawn. g3 threatening rook a1 mate with advantage. 
checkmate. This bishop still isn't playing. Takes, takes, threatening checkmate. And I, did, did he resign here? No, he played king f1, stopping mate. And Subtle said, I have more pawns, e4. And Kavalik had enough because I'm going to play f4, f3, and I'm going to make two queens and mate you. That's, that's one sorry bishop on b5. Also, if you play knight check with the fort, king e5, just what I wanted to do. Perfect. But since I'm playing pawn here, pawn here, mate, and there's not really a good defense to that, he resigned. Now, many times in my career, me, when I beat a higher rated player, we both play okay, and then they make a blunder because they miss something, and now I'm winning, and then I win. And you're like, wow, you beat a higher rated player. And I'm like, yeah, he, you know, he hung a pawn because he didn't see a check or something. But when Suttles beats higher rated players, he just outplays them and beats them like he's the better player. If you can play someone and you always have an advantage and it's increasing, either you're using an engine, which is the most likely, or you're better than your opponent. That's the way I like to beat people. We're like, I'm better, that I'm much better, that I'm winning, that my technique is good. Not they're better, I'm better, they're better, I'm better, they're better, I'm better, and then they hang a rook. And I'm like, well, I won because they hung a rook, but I'd rather win by playing better than them. And that's how Suttles beat people. He was what we call a deep strategic thinker. He fiancated his bishops. He liked getting pawns a lot and would sacrifice a piece to get many pawns. And as you can see in the end games, pawns are very valuable. Okay, last but not least. I have a question. I have an answer. So, yeah, we see Suttles beating some of these really top players. Is there a reason that you can think of why he didn't get to that level? I mean, he made Kabbalik look pretty silly there. Right. I could show Suttles' worst games if you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> but by, the, by the way, if you take a typical 1700 player, and they've been playing for 10 years, let's say. I'm just making that up. If I pick their three best games they're ever played, you would say, why is that guy 2300? You, you would. You'd be like, that guy plays great. What's wrong? And I'm like, well, I didn't show the other games. Um, well, to be perfectly honest, I don't think it was a talent issue. I think it was where he lived. I think when you live in Canada and you want to, the only way to play world-class players is to travel all the time. And at some point, you know, like if you live in St. Louis now, you can just stay there and you'll play in four or five super GM tournaments every year if you're if you're that good. You'll play Sinkfield Cup, US Championship. They have these round robins where the average range is 2660. And you'll travel occasionally and, and play. If you live in, in you know, British Columbia, Canada, and you wanna play other grandmasters, they didn't have internet then. So you're flying to Europe and you're hopefully getting invitations to Europe and Maybe they would want to invite Yes or Sarah Juan instead, or Larry Evans, or Kavalik. And so he probably didn't get a lot of invitations to play in Super GM tournaments in Europe. And probably he was playing most of his strong players in a couple of Canadian tournaments, Canadian Open, and then also uh, at the Olympiad. And he was playing in all the Olympiads, but that's only every two years. And then he would play board one, and he would play the best. But he didn't play in a lot of Super GM tournaments because he, he lives in Western Canada. So, man, truth hurts. And by the way, I'm going to compare him to me because I am me. So I compare him to somebody. I was brought up in Michigan, which is not a hotbed of chess. And, and if you want to play 23, 24, 2500 players, when I was growing up, it's not in Michigan. And weirdly, I still don't understand why, by the way, Ohio had lots of tournaments with Masters and IMs and GMs. So I was driving to Ohio once a month. My dad would drive me to Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Dayton, and they had tournaments with lots of Masters and Grandmasters and stuff, and not in Michigan. So in Michigan, when I was improving as a preteen and a teen, I was the highest rated player in the tournaments. You can't get better doing that I was 21, 22, 2300, and I'm beating up on 1700s because that's all they got in Michigan. 
But I would go to Ohio. We would travel to big tournaments like the U.S. Open. I would play in the U.S. Junior Championship, and we'd have to travel a lot for me to play somebody good. And again, there was no internet, so I couldn't spend 10 hours a day playing chess on the internet. So actually, people had different problems back then. If you wanted to learn openings, you bought books that were no good instead of, you know, Chessable and Chess.com and Lee Chess and all these other sites where you can get, you know, Aim Chess. There's so many sites you can go to and do billions of puzzles and opening prep and all that. I mean, etc. Okay, now this was against my good friend, my pal Benko. No, he wasn't my good friend, but I knew who he was. Uh, Flipboard. This is Suttles versus Benko. Benko was a candidate for the world championship, and he was definitely top 20 in the world, possibly at his peak top 10 in the world. Possibly. I'll say top 20. I'll be nice. Yeah. It's top 20 for sure, Benko. Okay, Suttles is white. G3. Sammy Shoker's nodding somewhere. Bishop G2. D it's like he's playing black, but he's playing white, because this is what he did. Bishop D2 confusing the audience. And if you want to know what player has done something similar recently, they do it with black, not with white, is Hikaru Nakamura. In some King's Indians, <clears throat> when white fianchettos the bishop, Nakamura will play D6, Bishop D7, Queen C8, Bishop here. I've seen him do it. So he stole all of his ideas from, from Duncan Suttles. Knight c3, queen c1. He wants to play bishop h6. So again, these aren't positions you'll get every day. These aren't positions that are in a book. And these are positions you can go to chess base and ask what the best move is because chess base didn't exist. So when Suttles is playing Benko, Benko's just like, what is this? What's happening? And then Suttles is like, this is the way I play. This is what I do. Queen b6. So what he's saying is, if you play bishop h6, I'll trade, and b2 is not defended. So he's stopping bishop h6 for the moment. Knight d1. That's what you were all going to play. You were like, ooh, knight d1. Mepex choking on his own rage. Knight d1 defends the b-pawn and defends the f-pawn in case you do some kind of trick. And now we're, now we're going to play bishop h6 again, and our c-pawn can move, and our knight could go to e3 later, knight could go to f2 later. Knight d1, not a move I would consider probably. h5, Benko tries to play crazy too, although nowadays h5 isn't crazy. And h5 stops bishop h6, because rook is defending h6. Knight f3, knight d7, they start playing normal moves now. Knight c5 is a weird move to me, but okay, I guess it stops e4. b4, the knight goes to e6. I'm not a fan of that, blocking the bishop. a4. And by the way, when you see this pawn structure, playing b4, a4, b5 happens in a lot of openings. You're trying to hit that pawn structure. And c4, and with the bishop on the diagonal, that's why... Benko played c6, he wanted to thwart the white bishop, but if Suttles plays c4 and b5, he could knock down the center. Very hyper-modern. a5, he takes, because it can't be recaptured, his bishop's defending it. Rook b1, queen a3, very unusual play by Suttles, but he's up a pawn, he has his rook on the open line. For some reason, Benko moved his knight here, and Benko moved his queen twice and played h5. Which, if you play h5, h4, and your rook's on h8, okay, but now put the pawn back on h7. Knight g4, opening up his bishop. Rook e1, wants to play e4, I guess. Knight e5, they trade, e4. I mean, black, I think black has to play d4 here, otherwise... White bishop's going to be too strong. Now he took. The problem with d4 is it kills black's pieces. Black is like, look at me. Knight d4, bishop. So d4 really blocks that. And then my knight can come out on c4. And I can play f4 and e5. And white's just winning. 
So he took, rook takes, attacking the bishop. The bishop goes to c7, which is odd, because the bishop wants to be on this diagonal. But Benko decided to win his pawn back. He's like, I'm down a pawn, now I'm going to get it back. Queen b2, taking the diagonal. King h7, knight e3, he takes his pawn back. And Suttles wants to keep his pawn, bishop c1. Now, perhaps you've noticed in the games I've shown you, perhaps, Suttles retreats a lot. And one thing I've told my students over the years, if you retreat and that move is a good move, your opponent didn't see it. Opponents don't see retreats, they're not afraid of them. But he wanted to keep his bishop on this diagonal and thought this bishop was silly over here on the side. So the bishop goes back to the center. Queen c3, opening up his rook. Benko plays f5. And he sacks the exchange. Now, let's see. Mepex watches my stream a lot. Why did white sack the exchange? You got to watch my stream more. Does anybody know? Anybody? There's the thousands of people. Sack you always sack the exchange, right. So f5 is actually a big mistake, okay, because of the exchange sacrifice. But he probably didn't expect that, Benko. And now we take on b7. My rook is the greatest rook ever. I have a passed a pawn, and your c6 pawn is doomed. Doomed. And your king is a little suspicious too on h7. So I'm going to play bishop b2 and queen g7 mate, and queen takes c6, and bishop takes c6, and so forth. And black is going to sit here saying, I'm up the exchange for a pawn. Great. Black's rooks are really good. Not as, not as good as white's bishops. Two bishops, what else? Strangely, black's two bishops aren't very good. Okay, he played bishop c8, kicking the rook. Bishop b2, threatening the aforementioned checkmate on g7. Rook f6, stopping the checkmate. And he sacks the exchange. I wonder why he did that. Always sack the exchange. Okay, and this isn't really an exchange sack, I'm kidding. After this, he won his exchange back with knight to d5. And just like in the other two games, subtle sacrifices a piece or the exchange and gets two, three, four, five passed pawns. So his pawn, he's always getting a lot of extra pawns. You can't take the knight because the c pawn is pinned. So he played queen d6, takes, queen takes because his king would be really exposed if he took with the pawn. And then he just traded, took this, and he said, your four to three majority doesn't matter. That's not a passed pawn. I have three passed pawns, one for each of you. And he's attacking the rook. And he's defending his a-pawn. So the rook has to move. He plays bishop b5. You greedy people, which is all of you, you're all greedy. You would take that. Then after that, you'd be like, I wish I wasn't greedy. Yeah, you don't need that doubled pawn. That doesn't matter. Okay, bishop b5. Now, white's play is very easy. Push the c-pawn, the d-pawn, and the a-pawn. And keep pushing them. And don't stop pushing them and then get three queens. C4, he moves his king over. And white's gonna win. White's gonna play king b4, d4, d5, c5, a5, c6, a6, d6. So Benko tries for opposite colored bishops. Trying is the first step to failure. Bishop opposite colors gives you drawing chances but here, white has two connected past pawns, so there's no drawing chances. By the way, as an aside, if the king side didn't exist, just get rid of all those king side pawns. Get, get them out of there. Then this is probably a draw. But the thing is, black wants to sack his bishop for two pawns, so that would be king and bishop versus king if the king side didn't exist. But the king side does exist, so... White's going to be a piece up with all those pawns. Okay, so he played f4, so black is stuck on the king side. Then he moves his queen side up. Doesn't care about the f pawn, but he takes it because, you know, why not? 
Man, that looked really embarrassing. Benko didn't look like he had any drawing chances. And here Benko resigned. Terrible. So three wins over Super Grandmasters by Duncan Suttles, and all of them with past pawns, outplaying his opponent, playing funky openings, and getting positions that he liked that they didn't. And if you want to learn more about Duncan Suttles, the internet exists, and you can see a lot of his best games, especially by going to his Wikipedia page. And once again, I want to thank Aunt Anna for teaching chess to Wolf, Wolfgang Fleckenstein. Wolfgang is our sponsor. And if that didn't happen, the butterfly effect, we wouldn't have this lecture. So we want to thank Aunt Anna, Anna for the lecture. It, was, it wasn't because of you, it was because of her. Do you think you would ever have played chess if, you, if it wasn't for your aunt? He's like, how do I unmute myself? You did it. Uh, without my aunt, uh, I've never played chess. Yeah, exactly. It's so, possible. by the way, this story is very familiar to me. People are always asking, how did you learn chess? And I'm like, my dad was a master, so, you know. Okay. But most people are like, I, my bicycle, I fell down. I had to go to the hospital. I was in the hospital for a day, and somebody brought me a chess book while I was laying in bed, so I read it, and I like chess. I, or I went to the library, and somebody left a chess book on the table. I'm like, what's that? It's always some, you know, my aunt taught me how to play chess. It's always some, something you wouldn't suspect necessarily that gets people into chess. Nowadays, this is obviously 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Nowadays, the internet's just all chess, so it's easy. Now, famous people all over the world are playing chess. They're playing on Lee Chess, chess.com, and they're using Chessable, they're using Aim Chess. They're doing all kinds of chess stuff online, so now it's easy. But, you know, when, when I was a kid, I only played chess because my dad was a chess player. Otherwise, I don't think I would have ever heard of it. All right, thanks for watching our lecture on Duncan Suttles. If you want to sponsor a lecture, contact Karen, karen at atlchessclub.com, and we'll do a lecture on what you want us to do. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye.